Okay, welcome back. I'm still Craig Wright and we're continuing with our masterclass programming on supercomputers. We've access, uh, given access um, to an access node and we're going to start on that this week. Next week we'll be then opening up and um, taking you across to um, some of the large memory nodes as well as um, uh, some of the other processor nodes. So for the moment we're just going to get you um, started on um, uh, ICC and compiling and all that sort of fun stuff. So we're in Intel um, x86 world of course because that's what we run. So um, one of the particular types of processors are the 5500, um, I don't even try and pronounce it, um, terrible names, I prefer the Knight Bridge and whatever else names I can actually pronounce them. So this is a little bit of a how-to uh, for an ICE IP95 blade. Now what you see is um, a couple processors there, um, lots of memory. There are different types and varieties of these things. Uh, some of these are designed for CPU plus large memory, others have um, uh, either coprocessor or GPU cards involved as well. Uh, we'll go through all of that sort of stuff as we're doing this. In our, our little world, the majority of what we have is SGI for high memory and um, other things for um, processor, like coprocessor like the Xeon Phi's or um, um, also GPU based cards. So block diagram, how this stuff sort of works. This is a main chip. Uh, we're, we're talking about our CPU, not our GPU or coprocessor, and um, it's interesting how things have gone back to a coprocessor world. In the old days, back 286, 386, I'm sure many of you um, uh, who have been around that long would remember um, like a 287 or a 387 if you've been around for a, a time. Um, comparatively, uh, those who are a bit newer probably won't remember that because Pentium actually started merging the math coprocessor uh, and the, the processor in one chip. That's changing again in that um, we split things off in the, the world of um, how we do computing and um, coprocessors again went out there to the world but um, it may actually be merging again as um, Intel are looking at creating a chip that combines the workings of a Xeon Phi and their Knight's Landing, or whatever they want to call it these days, type um, environments. Now what that means is we have gone through a bit of a revolution. So things have changed, but they're changing back to how they were. So new tech has come there and um, um, basically started uh, revolutionizing things and then gone back to where it was. So uh, how we, we talk on these, we have different speeds of course, the, the faster the better, some of the, uh, the newer ones are uh, 2033 and above, uh, so depending on what we have, we have the, the number of gigabit per second uh, that we get between RAM and um, the processor, faster the better the faster the bus speed, the more communication we have. And you'll see that uh, on 1333 you have 32 gig per second. Some of the newer ones are around 60 gig per second. So that gives us a lot of, of speed processing. On the bus, on the other hand, we only have um, uh, 6.4 or so uh, gig. And this is how these different devices talk. So that, that's always one of the constraints, how quickly different devices actually communicate. Now, when you're looking at um, PCIe e, um, times 8, times 16, etc., that gives you a, uh, a variety of buses that actually communicate very quickly. And um, when we, we start adding um, our interconnect, which would be things like InfiniBand or uh, 100 gig, Ethernet that's coming out or even 10 gig Ethernet that's fairly common now, then that allows our, um, our system to talk as if processes were really part of the same machine. So when we're starting to interconnect these different devices, it's then taken so that um, all these different 
chipsets, and my mouse is being a bit mucky today, uh, that connect really start communicating between the different blades as if it was one big machine. So as we have different cores on the processors, they start running in a parallel format really fast together as if there were many, many processors on the one machine. So um, our microarchitecture, uh, we can let you have a bit of a read through all of this later. I won't go into too much detail, but for the moment this is uh, sort of how it all comes together with, between the registers, etc., uh, with our i7 register sets. Uh, now, this is one of the interesting changes that we see between 64 and 128 bit registers, uh, which are quite common now uh, over anything like um, CPUs or even our GPU based systems. Uh, we, we all have. Um, uh, either the 64 or 128 bit register. And um, the difference with something like a Xeon Phi is that it operates on a different instruction set for any of those who have started already reading some of the Intel documents here that operates up to 512 bit registers. So it far extends any of the MMX register that you're going to see. Um, I'm making the assumption that you already know what a register is that I don't need to go too much into detail of that. Um, if not, please send some details and I'll, I'll give you some reading on what they are. So uh, Intel SIMD extensions, you can notice some of the extensions there for um, uh, quad word, double quad word, etc. type registers and how they fit together, what we can fit into them. So whether we start with our old tech with um, um, eight byte registers uh, made up of multiple nibbles, our MMX ones, our words, etc. It allows us to program many things. So with the Intel XMM registers, we're really looking at a vector system. So when we were thinking about HPC and the difference between um, clusters and high processing computer uh, type resources, way back in the day, and we're talking uh, the 90s and, and all of this, and people were talking about craze um, being vector systems. This is really the difference that we're, we're looking at. So our vector type system now is common. So everything is becoming a cluster type technology. In the old days, and we're talking maybe 15 years ago, um, to make myself sound ancient on this sort of uh, level. The old days we're looking at um, a series of machines that were made of individual uh, processors that were joined by interconnects the same way as we have single processor cores that are made uh, with many, many cores on the one chip. So other things that have been done, uh, enhanced cache subsystems. So it's a better memory hierarchy. You remember from last week we mentioned that uh, the difference in cache is it's very, very fast. So uh, by having very, very fast cache, that allows us to effectively move through and load everything that we need to work on uh, rather than having to go to main memory. So if we look at our uh, start with N, don't even want to try and pronounce it, um, chip set, we have our, our different cores. So we've got socket one and socket two. This is a rather small core compared to some of the machines now. This, uh, each of these cores would, uh, with hyper threading would be either two or more virtual threads. And if we look at the Xeon Phi card, then each core on the Xeon Phi uh, can have four threads. So uh, where we're looking at um, a 61 core uh, Xeon Phi, something like the 7120P, then what we have is 60 usable cores, one to maintain and just make sure the clock's balanced and all the rest, and up to 240 threads. Each of these in our main CPU talks to layer one and layer two cache. We have a shared layer three cache and then main memory. So the more we can do in our cache, 
of course, the more we can actually work on. So one of the things we're going to be looking at this week and um, uh, what we have here is a lab for you to start playing with. I will send through where GCC is. Um, it's not linked at the moment, but um, I'll make sure I do that right after this so that everyone can get access to it. Um, the machine you're accessing as an access node um, is uh, basically a small slice um, that we're um, sharing so that we can get, um, so I can lock things down a little bit more, I guess, and, and try and isolate anything. Um, at the same time, the machine you'll be um, connecting into next week is a lot bigger. It is a, um, a shared memory machine with um, uh, just over three terabytes available. So if you can imagine uh, what you have on an average laptop hard drive with one or two terabytes these days, um, the machine you'll be playing with or, uh, where we're moving into next week in next week's lab is actually going to be able to load your entire hard drive up and play with it itself. So that's what we're basically doing. Not that I'm, I'm saying that you should try and load up everything you can, but uh, that's where it will be. Um, you've got a nice sort of uh, area to play on that machine too. It will have, uh, I think we've, we've allocated 16 terabytes uh, of uh, fast storage, but which is more than enough for what we're doing here. So, C, C++ compiler. So what we want to go through is setting up some of the um, different environments, first of all. Um, IA32, Intel 32-bit architecture, Intel 64 is the Intel 64-bit architecture, and IA64 is uh, the IA64 architecture. So when you log into the machine, uh, you're going to want to try some of this and uh, I'm going to let you flub around first and what will happen later in the week is anyone who's still having problems uh, will go through and I'll give you a, a detailed walkthrough of what you need to do. So uh, I'm terrible that way in that I actually like people to try and, and see what they're, they're going to do and, um, and have a bit of a play. Um, Tonight I will send through the location for those who can't find out where it is of the ICC and ICPC compilers. The difference being ICC is the pure C compiler and ICPC is the Intel uh, C++ compiler. These are fairly much what you would expect from something like GCC or, or any of the, uh, the open source ones except uh, I guess it's more optimized or it, it's able to be more optimized from Intel. Um, so getting started, first thing you might want to do, have a ICC-help. That will give you some command line summaries. Man ICC, uh, for those who don't know, man is your friend. It's the manual. It's the help file in equivalent. And to find all of this, which ICC? Now, I purposely not linked that to a directory because we're going to go through some of this and, and finding and setting up, um, some of which I'll send through to the guys at CSU tonight. So once you've logged in, try and find, see where it is, do that sort of thing and um, go from there. Now compiler version, uh, minus V or dash dash uh, version. And this is where we start with our first lab. So your first test is, is fairly simple. It's not, not terribly difficult at all. We're going to build a little file here called test1.c. So we're defining a, a number value uh, at a million. Uh, we're defining our, our main function. We're going to uh, do a hello world. We're going to... Uh, it's fairly simple. We're just going to do that a number of times. So 
uh, doubling different values. I'm not going to try and explain what it does too much yet. Uh, we're hoping that you uh, don't have too many problems there because, I mean, at the end of the day, um, we have a print, a for loop, return. It should be very simple. Um, if there's more than that, I can't, uh, I mean, we will answer questions, etc. But um, it, it's very simple. So ICC flags. We're, we're just doing a pure C, not C++ um, sort of compilation at the moment. We're going to modify all of this. So uh, we want to look at our compiler options. And so by the end of the week, I'm hoping everyone has um, uh, tried that because I'm going to uh, go through and actually put up a, a recording of what you need to do if you haven't done it. So if you can't get through this yourself in the next couple of days, don't worry, there'll be a interactive step through it uh, video anyway. So you can sit there, um, run the compiler, watch the video, do it yourself. I just prefer if you have a bit of a play and try and get it going yourself first. Everyone should be able to uh, sort of flub their way through, but that's just how it is. Okay, so what we have, we have our um, our test file. We're going to compile an object file, so looking at that, test1.0, and then we're going to take, uh, take that and build an executable file called test1. This is Linux. So for those who aren't all that familiar with uh, the Unix Linux world, you will notice that um, there's no .exe. We can actually build an executable and not call it .exe. I'm hoping people don't have a problem there. So we want to save our compiler information. And to do that, we're going to go through that. We're going to have a look at our strings. Uh, hopefully everyone's familiar with strings. Once again, if you a more a Windows type environment, what you'll find is strings pulls out the information uh, that is in ASCII format from within the file. So in an executable, although there's a lot of binary data, there's also going to be comments and other material. So here we see if we do a strings uh, looking for comment, we find that in there. If we do it without the grep comment, we're going to get a whole lot of other information some of which will just be garbage because even in binary files you get um, uh, information that works out to uh, uh, an ASCII format, but that's what we're going to look at. So our Intel compiler, if we don't specify options, then it will go through and produce an executable file, a.out by default. So if you forget to name things, then it doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It still produces something for you. Whether you want to have a.out as your named output, that's probably unlikely. So you want to think about how you might rename that. And um, over time, it just helps to um, think about um, making sure that you set all your um, requirements up. So. Hopefully people have logged into the um, the first server already. I've noticed that there have been, uh, before the lecture, there have been about 100 people had been uh, already logging into the system. Uh, you should not have a problem even on the, uh, the login server. Um, it should run fast enough that um, um, even if everyone jumps on it once, it shouldn't grind to a halt. Uh, once we have the, the server from there, the way that it will will work at the end of this week is uh, you will be given well, the same username and password will log you into another server as well. That next server uh, will be the high memory server. It will be a different IP address in the 103.39 range, so that will be your next one. Then after that we will log you on to uh, some of the nodes which are in the uh, 43 range, so they're in sort of an A-class range. Uh, the 43 range has around 2,000 nodes that are meshed and um, 
you won't actually log interactively into those. You will use SSH to send from one machine to each of those nodes our compiled code. So I hope that explains how, how things work on this system. Um, I will be letting you actually log into a high memory system and, and people can play. Um, that doesn't mean that we want you to go and see if you can make a, um, a 5 gig executable in memory. Uh, I'm sure you could, but hopefully you won't. All right, the way that we've actually locked down things is hopefully um, you won't be able to get to things that I haven't opened up at any particular time. We've tried to lock down uh, individual bits and pieces and there's a lot of trust and monitoring. And so the way we will be securing more than anything else is um, watching and hopefully if anyone does anything too bad, we'll notice and be able to stop it before you kill anything or everyone else. At least that is my theory. So our compiler default options are all listed there. So we look for header files and known locations. Uh, that means ones that are already defined. We use uh, ANSI extensions, standard optimizations. Uh, all of those things are what things you want to play with with your compiler. I'm sure most people have probably played with GCC. For those who haven't played with um, ICC or any of the variants, they're a little bit different. If people want to have a bit of a play with Fortran during during this as well, uh, we'll open that up so you can do that. But I find that Fortran isn't uh, used a lot outside of academic circles or engineering circles anymore. It is actually used, um, but not as common. Big machines seem to use it a lot. I still hate Fortran. I still use Fortran. I guess it's a, um, a remnant of, well, doing engineering um, electrical engineering that um, I had to write lots in Fortran back in the late 80s and ish, made me hate the damn thing. All right, so our input file processing, we've got our, our file, file.c, we're, we're going to be using test1.c, test2.c, etc. If you want to play with other things, I don't mind. If you want to try something else, then uh, uh, I'm not going to uh, recommend that you try and load Metasploit um, in source code and build that yourself. You have a compiler, you have access to a compiler, that means there are lots of things you can do. Yeah, uh, at the end of the day, um, opening up even trying to lock down and make sure that you can use it enough without causing too many headaches for us uh, is rather scary. It's the first time I've opened up even part of the machine and each week we open up a little bit more to you during this course so we're hoping uh, by the end of the course we still have a machine there. So file.capital C, um, CPP etc. We're looking at um, C++ uh, source files. These are both passed to the compiler. Go through a parser type process first, make sure everything's correct. Uh, from there, we have um, file.a, file.so generally, which is our library file that is passed to a linker. Uh, we have our pre-processed files, so that goes to S standard out. File.o is our object file, which is also passed to a linker, and assembly file, which goes to an assembler. So I hope everyone understands the, um, the difference uh, between um, uh, sort of assembly and, and linking and, and binary. Um, I'm hoping that the sound's coming through correctly. I haven't heard any problems from um, uh, any of the guys over at um, Sound is good. Great. I just noticed someone had said um, uh, no sound and voice on Linux system. Hmm. Unfortunately, I, I can't really do much about um, how different systems work as long as it's uh, all going well here, perfect. And can I program the assembly directly? If you particularly want to, um, there's a lot more work, of course, than doing that. I, I'm, I'm um, old school. 
I actually like assembly. I used to work doing um, reversing uh, malware and packers and things like this. So uh, one of the things I would actually do would be taking compiled code and trying to uh, put it through disassemblers, take the assembly program and um, from the assembly program try and rewrite C or C++ for um, antivirus companies. Uh, that was, if you want an understanding why it, it's always slow, slow to um, get updates to antivirus, uh, if you think that someone is manually sitting there trying to pull apart the file, you start to understand what it's really about. So keeping uh, going on here, so we have our output files, file.i, uh, pre-processed file. We can produce those with the dash p option. Our file object, uh, minus c option, file s. Now what you should be doing is actually playing with some of this. When you start with your uh, test1.c, try the different options and have a look at it. So look at the difference between a pre-processed and an object file, have a look at the difference in size, have a look at the, um, uh, the difference in form, and um, yeah, just compare them all at the end of the day. So when we're going to run our file, we can also debug this. So we can do symbolic debugging, and to do that we're going to run ICC minus G. So test one uh, is what we're creating and test one dot C is our code. Now you should have access to um, our compiler code, what we're going to do. So our lab one code is there. Nice and simple just to get you playing with the compiler for week one really. Now run through this, have a look at the different vectorization have a look at um, um, what optimization levels we can we can do, and it's really about playing with the compiler this week just to get familiar with it more than anything else. Um, because once you start getting familiar with the compiler, then then we can start playing with the different options over the next week or two. So we're going to then try and build a new program, test two. So we're going to base that on on our existing code here. Uh, but we want to use two-dimensional arrays and see what we can do using two-dimensional arrays. I'm going to try and force loops and um, try and then coerce our compiler into collapsing the two-dimension loops into a single loop. So that, that's a bit of a um, uh, more advanced type topic for you. Um, but <coughs> Oh, excuse me, uh, but by the end of the week we'll have a solution either way. So if you can't work out any of these answers, don't worry, uh, we're going to get there. So do I need to change to Windows that is one of the virtual machines in my Linux host? Um, you may need to change to Windows just to get the voice, I don't know. Um, go to sometimes can be a bit flaky. Uh, works perfectly at times and works terribly at others and there doesn't seem to be much in between. So um, um, it's all being recorded and if the voice isn't coming through it will be loaded later. So we're going to try playing with our optimization levels and we're going to see the difference between no optimization and what we get. So different things, we want to um, try stack traceback. Now we're going to generate a whole lot of extra information in our object file and um, we're going to play with that. I'm going to be loading up uh, a number of um, programs onto the systems that you can then have a look at object code and um, assembly code that's generated as well. So once you've had a bit of a play then we can start looking at what we've got. Um, Yes, the lab files should be loaded on the CSU site already. Um, I'm assuming that um, uh, all that's been loaded now, James? Yep, Craig, um, access to the lab one instructions is yeah. up. At, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Oh, good. Great.
Um, yeah, yeah, they're up at learn.itmasters.edu.au. Um, Wonderful. Uh, John, John, another student, has just posted a, a direct link in the chat. I've just shared that to all. Yeah, I've just, yep, got it. So that's good. Yeah, so uh, don't worry too much if you have any problems. I will actually have a recorded walkthrough uh, about all the different steps that, that are in this lab. So. Uh, I, I do want people to try it themselves first. Uh, I find uh, you learn more if you actually go through and try things and even if you break what you're doing and it doesn't work, just the effort of trying that and learning is good. So we're, we're going to get you to type that in. Um, it's not too hard. We can do this cut and paste thing even in Windows. Um, make sure that you do tidy things up. Um, drop it into Vi or cat it into something. It doesn't, I don't really care how you do it, but um, just create your test file. You don't need to type it line by line. Um, once you've got there, edit away and um, um, create your code and your, your make file and everything works well. And if you don't, I'll just follow the step-by-step -step guide that I'm going to put up after hopefully you've already solved it. So. The default is no, not traceback, so no traceback info. Uh, we have different options that you, you want to try, dash W, suppress all warnings, display only errors, errors warnings, etc. Uh, so it depends on how much info you want. If you're doing this as a batch process and you're writing a script to go through and compile things, then you probably don't want a whole lot of warnings, or if you do, you want to re uh, redeploy them to different things other than the screen. So we want to think where we're going to actually put our thing, so our target processor. So ensure that you're compiling for the correct target system. Now, so as it says here, important for cluster systems. Not everything has the same compute nodes. Fairly much all the ones you're going to be using are the same. Nice and easy for now. Once we start actually getting you to do the open MPP uh, and compiling against the Xeon Phi, not just the CPU, that starts to change. When you actually start compiling this on both the CPU and uh, the Xeon, uh, the Phi system, or if we were going to do it on the GPU, then it, it all starts changing and it's a different game. Once we start actually doing that, then we have to think about which code we're generating where. So, um, on each of the systems, you can have a look at um, cat, proc, info, C CPU. Uh, that will give you the speed, the cache size, other bits of information, um, what you have on the particular machines and cores. That will be a little bit different on the login, the access node that you have, to the high memory node that you're getting, um, and then it will be different again on the compute nodes. The difference in each of these is when we're forming a cluster of machines, we generally have uh, something where we run how you log in, um, and we're not actually doing it the way that we would normally do it at the moment. What we've, we've set you up with for an access node um, has a, a few tools that we've isolated like R and ICC and whatever else. And We've not used the module command. I, I thought it was probably simpler um, to start just on command line uh, rather than actually setting you up with a menu and a module command. Uh, but we will actually go through the module command in this course and show how systems generally run. So other options, we have our floating point options, uh, what we're going to set. And you've got an opportunity, just play try the different options, see what happens, look at the errors, change rounding modes, change all the precision modes, whether we're safe or not, uh, put exceptions in there, and just play. And the fun bit about being a programmer is uh, if it's not your system, you get to play on it. So I'm actually saying that. That play does not mean try and break it and compromise it. It just means uh, try the different options. So, um, how to log into the server. Uh, it's SSH. 
if you haven't got a username and, and login already, hopefully the uh, uh, friendly people at Charles Sturt University and IT Masters will um, make sure that you've got a um, general username, which is a nice, bland, boring CSUI number, and a password. Make sure that um, uh, you can then SSH to a machine. So, alrighty. Um, obviously, I've been working. For me, vectorization is probably um, too common a word. Uh, uh, what I might do. Um, I'll just, anyone who doesn't have a username and login, can you just chase up um, James and others and they'll hey. get you everything you need. Yeah, just to let everyone know, uh, details were sent out this morning with the IP address and the username and password to log into the, the supercomputer. Um, if anyone hasn't received those, please just uh, send us an email at admin at itmasters.edu.au. All right, so um, I'll send through for the guys at IT Masters a little document on vectorization. Um, probably best if I do that rather than try and explain it now. Um, I've been um, obviously working on um, PSOs and, um, and uh, parallelized code for too long and uh, and multi-threaded systems, so I've sort of forgotten that, well, how I talk isn't always how everyone else sort of um, gets around things. Now, um, uh, should CPP be found on the server? Yes, CPP is part of um, ICC, so that is uh, one of the Intel program things and um, I'm going to actually, I haven't linked it, I wanted to um, get people to log in and have a bit of a look around first. That will be linked uh, this afternoon just so that it's in path. Uh, it's actually there but um, uh, I'll link it into the, um, the main path for everyone uh, sort of this afternoon. Some people have actually found it by playing around. I'm always interested in seeing who uh, plays around and what they do, and once you do that, then you'll just be able to do ICC from the command line. Uh, ICC can be found on the server, but it's not linked to the um, to the path, so I'll put that there so that you can get to it right after, okay? Now, to keep going, so optimization flowchart, we have our start gather performance data. Uh, for those who haven't used it, I, I recommend going out to the Intel site, have a bit of a look at VTune um, and the performance and analysis tools that they actually have. Um, they're actually quite nifty and neat. You can analyze data issues, look at how things work, go through um, different uh, threading options, look at um, different math kernel libraries, and some of these are optimized quite well, others less so. Uh, enhancements, test results, etc. It's a big process in doing this. It's not just uh, try once and hope things work. The whole building fast code option means that we go through um, test after test after test. So, um, Dash OO, turn off optimization, uh, dash fast, etc. I want you to try some of these things later. So once you've built this and you've created the code and compiled it, try compiling it differently. See what the differences are. Okay? So assembly listing. We could actually do this and, and do a double add, double B, whatever else. Um, create object files that way. We can then look at um, uh, how that gets created in our system, what we get, list out uh, what we have. So we have dash S option, 
Now, we compile to an assembly file. This is fairly close to machine language, of course. Assembly basically then converts to that uh, binary zero one stuff that the computer likes. And I recommend have a bit of a play to look at all this. So um, this file will be loaded up there. Try some of these things yourself. Now, vectorization. I will go into more details in a file for you to read, but um, a vectorizer is a way of ensuring that each of our threads, our extensions, and our cores are actually optimized to run um, at the same time without having either bottlenecks or well, one thread that sits on one core. I'm sure everyone has worked on old code on Windows machines or Linux machines um, that has been designed for single CPU machines back in the day, and you find that it just focuses on a single core, and that's it. So what we're moving to now is trying to ensure that um, we parallelize each of the threads, each of the processes to ensure that things happen as quick as possible. This is very important in HPC. What we want to do is not have everything go in a big blap and concentrate on one core uh, while others finish. We want to try and make sure that everything ideally finishes about the same time and then frees up our machines at about the same time. So vectorization. Um, we can either do it with intervention or allow the machine to do what it thinks would be best. So our first bit here is we're going to try um, 32 and 64-bit architecture compilation and how that works. Um, try the different processor extensions. Look at how all of this gets split up and um, then we can even create a report on that. So do we want diagnostic information or write down into loops and non-loops and lots of fun stuff. So what we're trying to do is take single instruction, multiple data processing and create really a way that we optimize the running of our code. We want this to split off to different machines, different processes, whatever else we're doing, um, so that we have, as quick as possible, a result. So, things to avoid. Don't have function calls. Don't have unvectorizable operations, other than mathematical ones. Uh, we don't want things that are going to hang. Now, by unvectorizable operations, Interactive operations would be such a, um, we're not going to, for instance, have something that is going to require user input being split between the different cores. We are going to want to be able to control what occurs. So um, we're not going to try and mix vectors in the same loop because that could complicate things. So. We want to try and make our code vectorizable. We want to make everything be able to split into multiple cores and run simultaneously. So ideally, we're going to have everything run fast. So when we're, we're taking our different arrays um, that we have here and we want to um, uh, collapse our dimensions that we're, we're going to add to this. We want this to run against multiple calls simultaneously um, and give us a result as quick as possible. That's what we're trying. So, restrictions. Vectorization re uh, really comes down to two major factors. One, hardware. We have underlying hardware. We can't do more than our hardware will allow us. We have um, target architectures. If we're building for CUDA, uh, CUDA, then we're not going to be able to 
expect that to run the same if we're building and optimizing for a zero and phi. One uh, in CUDA type systems, something like the NVIDIA cards, then we have 64-bit uh, architecture and registers, and we have a lot of small fast cores. So we might have a thousand cores on a card, but the um, amount of memory and processing per core is lower than we have on something like the um, the Phi. And the Phi, we have um, 60 cores and 240 threads potentially, but each individual core is larger and can process more. It also has a larger register, uh, register set at 512 bit. So we can't compile the same way for each. And if we're thinking about doing a 512 bit register and moving that across to um, run a, a 64 bit uh, machine or a 128 bit machine, it's not going to just port. So we have to think about how we're going to do this. So um, what we do for our source code makes a big difference. So, optimization. We have two compilation modes, single file compilation and multi-file compilation. Uh, we could run that on different machines simultaneously or load it differently, depending on how we have our cluster or machines. So, single file, real object file for each source file being compiled. Um, if there's any questions about any of this, please feel free to um, uh, put together uh, what it means and, and I'll point you off either to other documents or uh, give explanations. But for the moment, we're running through, of course, very quickly. We have other things such as um, um, optimization levels, GNU, C, C++, or um, Intel are similar but different. Um, into procedural optimization, how we do that, and what we really want you to do in this first level is start playing with each of these different, um, just have a look at what the different levels go by. It's not going to matter too much that I'm sitting here um, reading all this out and, and telling you about it. The best way is to actually get on the system, run ICC, and try the options. Manfile is your friend, and the help is your friend and we can try seeing what they do and I'm, I'm a firm believer that the best way to start to learn this sort of stuff is to actually sit there and play with it and um, just experiment with the differences in code, the differences in how it happens. So, um, so when we're looking at profile guided optimization, GPO, um, instrument the program, so we want to see what we get run what we have, so we create our test one uh, executable and um, see what we get and then try our final compilation and then optimize that to run efficiently for the system. So we want to over time build something that um, is more and more effective and efficient. And it's not even necessarily how we write our code in the first place. Writing, writing code efficiently is good, but we also need to know how we compile that code. And compiling it efficiently is also part of uh, what we need to ensure. So performance, how do we do it? How do we ensure that this works? Well, we need to make sure that we run through, test, run through, test, run through, test. I know it sounds boring, but that's part of learning how to do this well. And not only part of learning uh, what we're going to do, when we're looking at performance improvements, then we're really seeking not just to compile our code and have it work, but to compile our code in the fastest, most efficient manner. Now, Something people don't get is just because you have a big cluster, lots of CPUs, whatever else, doesn't mean that you have um, uh, carte blanche on, on how much you can waste. CPU cycles matter, they cost. And the more you can get out of a machine, the 
better you optimize your code, in other words, the more effective everything you're doing will be. So the real secret to high processing uh, and high performance computing, HPC, whether we say high processing or high performance, in my opinion, really linked to the same thing, is optimizing both the hardware and the software. Now, once we have built the hardware, that's the easy bit. The hard bit is then optimizing that so that we have code that runs really fast and really efficiently without wasting any access, any time that is going to be there. As low a cycle uh, sort of use we can get is what we're trying for, okay? So, guidelines. Minimize changes to your program after you instrument um, code changes. Basically, if you go and make a lot of changes, if we get our source code, so lab one here, and we change it too much, um, and then instrument um, code is repiled and checked, we're not going to really be comparing the same thing. If we change our source code and start testing changed source code, then it's not the compiler that we're checking. I think that's fairly much uh, understandable, I'd, I'd hope. So know the section of code that are heavily used. Okay, so uh, with what we have here, we don't really have that bigger data set or anything like that, but if we're going to grab information and take it from um, something such as a uh, external database or something like this, if we're going to pull that in, we need to know what we need to do to maximize program execution. What do we need to, to save? What do we buffer? What do we have ready? And if we are pulling something from a uh, ZFS or a Hadoop or whatever else file system across our local network or maybe even uh, from a, an archive store, then we're going to have time where we are sitting there waiting and wasting execution cycle. We need to think about how we design all of that. So optimizing our program, uh, long term, we actually have to think about data structures and how we, we set all that as well as uh, where we put these things Okay, so three stages, um, one instrumented code, so prof gen option, that's going to give us an instrumented executable. Running our instrumented executable, we get a dynamic information file, dot, dot dyn, and compiling the, app, uh, the application using um, prof use, and then we start looking at how we optimize what we're doing. So the difference with many um, uh, programming courses and everything I hear is we're not, um, I have a nice simple uh, set of labs really because what we're not trying to teach you is C coding. What we want to teach you is to compile your sources, have a look at how it runs. Run, have a look at what we can do, uh, look at the um, Dyn file, and then try and optimize that for the system you're on. You can do this either with your own code and machines later, uh, as well as what we have here. So practice, practice, and practice. I have to say that one. So code coverage tool is another tool that you find there. Um, code cov uh, really goes into how much of the code is exercised with uh, respect to workload, and um, it's going to allow us to actually get some um, visualizations and analysis of um, what we're doing. So it compares profile runs as well, so it, it allows us to see how it runs over time. We need to have our sources, so of course you don't delete your um, test1.c or uh, other files. We make sure we keep the SPI file uh, and other things, the Dyn files, etc. And 
playing with these tools allows us to start optimizing for a machine. So, uh, oops. Um, in some of the um, the files that the CSU guys are loading up there, there's a uh, uh, a block I sent them today to load called uh, uh, codecoverage.html. There's a, a local uh, set of HTML files, uh, Intel ones that you can start having a look through and, and see how that all works. Oops, just jumping too far ahead. So what we're trying to do is uh, optimize our code to run well. So we need to think about how we're looping, what we're doing to um, uh, make sure that our threads are, cor are, are correct, that we are sending between machines correctly, and at the end of the day, that we're not wasting processor time. So, other bits, um, optimization. We're going to um, look at some of the um, uh, different levels of optimization. Uh, optimization. Uh, as I said, I really to go through the um, the lab properly, you're going to need to not only compile this little bit of code there um, with your flags, etc. So that's your test.c file, and you've got a make file. So make sure that you do both of those. Um, if you have a problem, know that. The solution will be put up at the end of the week. So I want people to try this themselves first. Um, look at the optimization levels. So that's what we're talking about here. Oops. So go through, um, look at um, 0, 0, 0, 0.0, 0.1, 0.2, 0.3, and um, how does that change the code you're creating? Has it changed the assembly code? Try uh, doing it that way as well, and have a look at what the differences are. So, next, flow dependency. Look at what we're doing. Flow dependency, anti-dependency, output dependency. Have a look at how we can structure code in different ways and what the different results are. Okay, so play, once again. Try things like um, for uh, for loops, some, whatever else, and look at the differences in what actually comes about. So, automatic parallelization. Now, this is a feature that you get in um, the Intel compiler, and uh, it takes serial portions of input program into multi-threaded code. So, it looks at the loops and uh, how the code is actually structured, and it will then try and optimize that. So. The parallel runtime support there um, is similar to things like OpenMP, and um, we're going to be playing with some of those in this course as well. Um, but different options, dash parallel, uh, thresholds, report, etc. So look at the different um, options there, uh, look at how we can do that, and um, try creating these different loops so that we can run through and try our code in different formats. The big thing to take away from today is jump on there, try ICC with different formats, try using different stack sizes, try doing different things, and look at the different optimization reports, look at uh, compiler reports, um, et cetera, and go through what your output is how fast it it runs, etc. Um, okay, are there weekly quizzes for this course? I will be giving some tests and whatever else, and at the end there will be. So there is a weekly lab at the moment, um, and really for week one, what we're we're going to be doing is um, you take the code and try each of these um, options here. So jump on the machine. Uh, try producing an assembly listing. You will have access, of course, to the PowerPoint. So uh, if you don't have uh, any luck, go back to the PowerPoint and go to the assembly listing slide and try it that way. But do remember, at the end of the week, I will actually give you a solution 
for the lab. So I will load up another video that goes through as a step-by-step -step and shows you exactly what you need to do if you haven't done it already and if you haven't solved any of these areas. So you can check what you've done against uh, my answers. All right. I think that's fairly much the end of this week. And um, yeah, that's fairly much it for now. So again, um, thank you for coming along. Thank you for uh, being a part of this. Uh, jump on, make sure you can get access to the, the system. Have a bit of a play. I'll link ICC um, directly for those who haven't found where it is. Uh, outside the normal run path and then you can start uh, typing in or cutting and pasting your own version of um, uh, test1.c for the week and um, go from there. Thank you Craig. Uh, it's just James here. I'll just um, make note of certainly the discussion forum is there at learn.itmasters.edu.au. Uh, so Craig's encouraged everyone to to work out a bit of this for ourselves, which is really great. Um, but if you want to post anything up on the forum, post where you're up to or anything anything a bit odd that you found or anything interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, so just some questions there. Uh, what systems did I start with? Um, I started with uh, a combination of deck machines, uh, both Unix type machines on, on deck and um, some CPM. Uh, that was way back in the day. Uh, and VAX. There's a lot of VAX here in Australia for some reason. Uh, VMS. I don't know why, but we seem to have been a, a stronghold for VMS. And then I got on to um, um, Sun and SunOS machines before they became Solaris. And then I migrated to Windows because that's what people expected me to do. So that's my machine background. Um, yes, I had some IREX. Um, so, not as much IREX as you'd expect, more sun. Um, so, uh, welcome for giving access. At the moment, you, you'll just be on a, um, an access node. Next week, we, uh, I'll then port you across to a high memory system, um, and then etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So, bit by bit, you'll get different access to different areas, just so we can play with each of these. Um, ICC compiles GCC isms. Um, not sure what you mean by that. There's a whole lot of differences in um, uh, compilation code and all the rest. Uh, wow, someone's still got IREX. <laughs> um, IREX background, I, I guess. There's, there's still some machines out there running IREX. So I haven't seen many for a while, but anyway. Hmm. Very nice. Okay, at that, uh, I'll um, stop recording and um, we'll uh, let you get on and play and um, have a great afternoon and yeah, start trying. On the weekend, if you haven't got there, just remember that um, I'll be um, going over all this for you so that you can, um, uh, well, check your answers, etc.